just in case there's any data why we're here, we're going to have a presentation on the expectations of the Monarch Command Officer. If you are in the right spot, you're certainly welcome to stay, but you might want to slide out now if that's not what you're here for. So this presentation really is for you. It's for the organization, but ultimately it's for all of you that made it here. It's for you to know what's going on, to know what we expect out of you. Um, there are really no secrets. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So looking around the room, I think I know everybody, but just in case, I'm Scott Walker. I'm one of the assistant fire chiefs here at Phoenix Fire Department. Currently manage the Homeland Division, and I've been on the job for about 24 years. So this presentation today is uh, really designed to build upon what we've already been doing build upon the Command Officers Leadership Academy, the Captain's Leadership Academy will be doing. Um, it's to build on other conversations that are hopefully happening out there. This is gonna be a strategic level, what I describe as organizational leadership level presentation on expectations for you to know. Um, this isn't really gonna be task level stuff, it's not gonna be tactics. We do a very good job at that. If you need help in that, obviously the CTC has opportunities to help get you tactically ready for the promotional process, but more importantly, to do our jobs out there. So that's really the, 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 um, the level and the take and the presentation is going to be more focused on that, letting you know about, know about that. Hopefully you're aware, but you may not be, know or may not be aware that um, our organization, and we aren't alone, Peoria Fire, we have people from Peoria Fire here, regionally throughout our region and nation, nationally, the same, we're all in the same boat. We have um, a significant loss of our membership through retirements. So for the Phoenix Fire Department in the last few years and on the, for the next few years, we are losing several hundred people. We are in the middle of a three-year window where about two-thirds of our command staff are going to be retired. So if you just think about that, we're probably 40, 45 percent of the organization, the top of the organization, and when I say top, in relationships, in wisdom, in experience, and knowledge, is gone. Now, we've hired really good people, we have educated people, we have excited people that want to come up, all of you want to come up in the organization, and so we want to make sure you're ready to come up, prepare you to come up, but we also know that you know, some of those are still going to have those relationships. They're not going to have those things they're going to have to build or the experience. So we organizationally need to prepare you for that. We all need to understand what that means to each of us and wherever we work now. So that's a pretty significant responsibility upon us. So I can tell you the fire chief is fully aware of that. She talks almost daily, if not daily, to the exec staff about what we're doing for succession planning. What are we doing to develop you and our membership out there? What are we doing for this future? So what we do in the, to now in this next few years, and this applies to Peoria as well, applies to everybody, what we do now is what our organizations will look like in 10 years. Right? We all probably said in our interview to get hired. We all worked hard to get hired. We all probably said something about it. We want to leave it better than we found it. Well, this is your opportunity to do it. Unlike any time in the history of our organization is the opportunities available for us that really want to leave your mark. You want to leave a mark. You want to, people in 10 years think about what this, looks, this organization looks like and who did it. It's us, it's Marcus Steele, it's Tim. You know, it's all of us can have that kind of mark. So just understand that's where we're at and that's where we're going. So while we have responsibility to make sure we prepare you, and we're doing that, as I said, through this presentation, um, if you notice the now called the command officers process as, as opposed to the battalion chiefs process, we have other materials on that bibliography. Hopefully you noticed, right? Speed of trust, um, other leadership materials. We are culturally moving in a new direction. We are going to the next level. And these things, hopefully you're queuing in on, these kind of presentations aren't something we've done in the past. I never really had these coming up in the organization, not something we focused on, but we are now and we know we need to. So we are making a concerted and significant effort to move this organization in this direction. So while we and the fire chief has this responsibility, so do all of you, so do all the members out there, our firefighters, engineers, our captains, everybody out in the organization. Right, if you have skills, you have interests, you have desires to move up, you need to let us know. Let somebody know. If you're not being mentored right now, reach out to somebody. And I put that on you is make sure those newer members, as all of most everybody is probably a captain in this room, reach out to those new firefighters, those new engineers, or newer, right? Reach out to them, mentor them. It's our responsibility to bring up everybody in the organization. I have had several people um, reach out to me in the last probably six months, they're in that one to five year range. And while that new group of, mem of members, you know, they may pose differences and, and then maybe 25, 30 year members, um, I tell you what, there's a huge interest in them for leadership, for development. They want it, they're reaching out to me. So if you think they're not out there, I'm telling you, you're wrong. You need to be looking for it. Look for those cues, for those members. We've all seen it, the members that, that guy's sharp, that person's sharp, they're going to be some go somewhere. They may be the next fire chief in 10, 15, 20 years, right? 
It's upon us to make sure that happens. You, one of you might be the next fire chief in 10 or 15, 20 years. It's upon us, me, to help you get there, right? So we all, we, we, none of us will be here in 20, 30 years probably, but we need to make sure our legacy lives on and what we do today, what we do in the next few years, will really cement that into this organization. So understand that responsibility we all have. You're gonna hear me talk a lot about leadership. So if any of you had any conversation with me, you ran into me anywhere, you probably, I have probably talked to you about it. I am passionate about leadership, what it means to me. I'm passionate about my own leadership development. I'm passionate about your leadership development. I believe it is the key to our success for this organization. I believe it's the key for success, success for any organization, but certainly my priority is ours and Peoria, like Rogers is, I'm sure Peoria, right? We all want our organizations to do well, and it's through leadership and understanding what that means is how we will improve our organizations. Their opportunities are very unlim are unlimited right now for us because of all the people leaving. No one is going to put the reins on you. If you want to do something, you want to have impact, the opportunity is there for you. Understand that it, it is amazing and how many opportunities are out there for us right now. So I don't like to read the slides, but I'll read the first couple because they're the objectives. I want to make sure you're clear uh, what we're going to cover. We're going to get an overview of today's Phoenix Fire Department and you can replace Peoria right in there just easily, right? It's not much different. Discuss the present environment versus the past environment. Better understand the role of today's command officer and the expectations upon us in that role. And just notice the building, right? This is the old, right? This is how we once were. This is the new. This is the new modern fire department, fire station, right? So we're also going to explore the leadership management and mentorship concept. This is my focus right here. This is what I call the trio of our success. Everything I do, everything you do will fit into these things, I can assure you. This is where you will be successful. We're going to identify the organization's leadership goals. How can we expect you to meet them if we haven't told you what they are? We're going to assess how we are performing, how I'm performing, how you're performing, how the organization is performing. Simply, are we reaching those goals, right? If we have these goals, and we do, are we reaching them? Do we reach them every day? Do we reach them once a week, once a month? We should try to reach them every day. And then finally, based on are we reaching the goals, we'll develop a strategy to reach our goals to meet our current and future needs. So before you leave this room, you'll have an idea what it will take for to reach those goals. You'll have an idea what it looks like, what your leadership maybe uh, vision will be, and how to get there. That's my, my commitment to you. My goal today is when you leave this room, you will come in better than when you came. My goal is to push you a little bit further today, give you some things you probably haven't thought of, some things you haven't heard of, but things you need to know about, things you need to know where we're going as an organization. And that's, that's our objective today. So the organization and you. So really this slide is to really try to help you understand where you fit in the organization. Right, we all operate at a certain level. So organizational leadership, there is a plane basically here that we need to understand as a command officer you're operating in, right? That's understanding who your relationships, you need to have relationships with, how you'll be successful with those relationships. You need to understand where the department's going and the organization's going. I have some vision about where we're going understand how outside of this fire department, maybe city departments or city hall, how that stuff, we interact with that to be successful. As command officers, um, while we all should be aware we operate, as command officers, you must be aware of where you operate. Your success depends upon understanding that. So the organizational structure kind of gives us a visual picture of that, right? We all know firefighters, engineers, captains, battalion chief, division chief, deputy chief assistant, and fire chief, right? But who's in those roles, right? Who is in those roles with you? Who is your peer? So, and also, who are you communicating up and down with? So it's important to know within that, to know where you operate, how you're going to be successful, who is your boss, you're communicating with them, they're communicating with you. You're communicating with those people that you lead. Right, right today, you lead people. You're responsible to lead people. Who are you communicating with? Are they communicating with you? We understand that pretty, yeah, that's pretty common knowledge. We get that picture, right? But more importantly, I think, is understand that horizontal plane that we now have to be aware of, especially as you move up in the organization horizontally, your tentacles need to be very wide, right? You need to understand, as a battalion chief, you should have relationships with maybe the chief at resource, the chief at EMS, the chief at training, because those are your strategic partners for you to be successful, right? Those are how you are going to make sure your members are trained and have the tools and have whatever they need to go do their job well. Because if our priority is taking care of those firefighters in order to go out there and provide service, which is our priority, how or best can you help that and ensure that happens? It's in these relationships. It's in no understanding where you're operating. It's understanding how the organization operates. It's having awareness that there is a procurement process and there are budgets and how those impact us, right? So as a division chief, now division chiefs run sections. They have budgets. Mark Gonzalez is at Fleet. Mark Gonzalez has to have a relationship 
with public works in order to buy fire trucks because they actually buy our fire trucks, right? If you want new fire trucks for your firefighters to go deliver service, Mark Gonzalez has to have to have that relationship. Mike Duran's at facilities. That's who fixes our fire stations is facilities through public works. He's got to have those relationships in order to fix your fire stations for your members out there. So who, know who, who's in those positions, know how to communicate, know how to get things done. It's this kind of a level of thinking and understanding on this, okay? So it's also important to understand where you fit in, as I said. So a couple examples here. Um, Chief Khrushchev in the Leadership Academy, if you've been to that, does a really good job of the six-foot rule. If you haven't heard it, I'll give it to you real quick. New firefighters get on the job, there's about a six-foot world we live in, right? And that's about what we know. We've all been there, new firefighters. You get off the fire truck, you pull a hose into that house, find yourself in the middle of that house, probably don't know what the house looks like, you don't know where the fire's at, maybe not sure why you're even there, right? But as we grow and mature and become captains, we take that next step, and you become a captain. Now your circle gets to be about 60 feet. Your world is about 60 feet. You have a little more vision. There's more expectations upon you. Your awareness is, is raised. Who you interact with to be successful is, is grown. Now we expect you to be inside that house with that firefighter and expect you to know what that house looks like and where the fire is at and why you're in there, right? And then as you take that next step into your career as a command officer, you go from maybe that 60-foot mark to 600. Battalion chief, division chief is operating about a 600-foot circle. But also think of this circle as really as a sphere, right? So everything in this sphere is yours to own and manage. Everything inside that is all is yours. And then as you move up the organization, you go from a battalion chief, division chief to a deputy. So you go from 600 to 6,000. Bigger sphere, bigger expectations, bigger world you control. And then as deputy to assistant, you go from 6,000 to 60,000, or to an assistant, assistant to the fire chief, it's 600,000. Fire chief's world is huge, right? Everything, those that interact, influences that interact her, upon her to help us be successful, huge. So understand that is how um, you grow as you grow within the organization. And I really like the next step rule because I think it does even a better job of visually giving you a picture of not only are you taking that next step, but you're also raising up. You're basically rising up in the organization. So firefighters go to captains. It's the next step in our career typically for most of us, right? It's going from step one to step two. But when you go to come, become a command officer, first level command officer, it's like going from step two up to step 10. It's not just the next step, it's the next big step. Not only is it a big step, but it's much higher. So now, as you're operating this plane we talked about, you're now closer to the fire chief than the firefighter in a lot of ways, right? Just in your position. So we now understand, we never forget where we came from. We never forget why we're here, about taking care of those firefighters, taking care of people on fire trucks to deliver service. But understand, at this new level, there's a different way of thinking, understanding. Your vision is going to be much bigger. You're going to understand more about the organization and how things get done. And you have to take a different perspective oftentimes. Understand, sometimes you have to make that hard decision. Sometimes you have to represent something that you may not even agree with, right? But you have to represent it. Now, that doesn't mean if your boss, if I come to you and say, I need you to go do this, if you think there's a better way of doing it, if you think there's a better, you know, you've tried it that way, it didn't work, doesn't mean you can't present that. Say, hey, you know what, I think we've done that. I've got this idea, I've already looked at it and vetted it through labor, we have the money for it, it's the right thing to do, what do you think about this? If you bring that to me, I'm gonna be like, great, sounds good, I can get to my same objective, let's go do it. But in the end, even great ideas sometimes we don't get to do. Maybe at the end, you know what, that's a great idea, sounds good, I can't make it happen today, I still need you to go out and carry this message out. The worst thing we do as command officers is go out there, and we've probably all been there, we've all seen it, been on the receiving end of this, is when Someone rolls into your fire station, your command off BC or somebody, throws it down on the kitchen table. Yeah, I just came from a meeting. I got to tell you, we got to do this. I think it's stupid, but I'm supposed to tell it to you, right? You lose all credibility, right? You, have, you are not leading anybody when you do that. You have no credibility when you do that. So even things you don't agree with, sometimes you got to represent. And that's part of moving up in the organization. That's understanding where you're rising in the organization. But with that ascension, you now have more control over things. You have more input in things, right? You have the ability to influence things. So that's the trade-off. That's the trade-off of moving up in the organization and the benefit. Your ability to impact the organization is much greater as you move into this next role because, as I said, it's a big step. You're raising up the organization. Your area of influence is much bigger, much more available to you, I assure you. Do you think the expectations are different for a battalion chief and a division chief? So what I like to do is I looked at, like to look at the roles we're at. The role you're at now, you can apply this. I apply this to my role. You can certainly apply this as that next step. And I'm talking to you guys as command officers. So I'm assuming that 
if you want to be a command officer in this organization, you will be one, right? The opportunity is there for you. So I am talking to you, you're like you're in this role. So break down the role of command officer. Division chief, battalion chief, doesn't matter. Division chief's a 40-hour staff captain or chief. Battalion chief's a 56-hour chief, right? But within that role, there is the strategic plane within that role. Then there's the tactical and there's the task. So if a firefighter's job is to pull a firehouse off a fire truck and take it into a house to put the fire out, and battalion chief's job is to respond and manage that incident, aren't those just their tasks, right? Firefighter's task, pull hose off fire truck. A BC's task is to go out and respond on incidents, right? But strategically, the battalion chief still needs to be aware about what's happening in the organization. You still need to be aware of where the organization is going. What kind of things are on the strategic plan? Is next year's budget good or bad? Right? I will challenge you right now. Do you know the answer to that question? You don't have to answer. It's rhetorical. I would suggest you should if you're taking the command officer's test. Because if the budget's going to be bad next year and you're a battalion chief, doesn't that impact your members? Doesn't it impact their ability to repair the fire truck, fix their fire station, have supplies, train? Doesn't it impact them? So maybe you can proactively preload that with them. Or maybe we can find ways to help save some money out there, right? Encourage guys to come to work and not sick, call in sick maybe as much. Or maybe we take care of our stations just a little bit better to save a little money. Because money, the pot, it's finite, right? If we spend it here, we don't have it here. So understanding is that strategic level, vision, how things operate, how the processes that this big organization moves forward. We're a big bureaucracy, right? How does that happen? Who do you need to be communicating with and have relations with to make that as seamless as possible? How do you help your members out there? And if you're a division chief, it's no different, right? Division chief, Mark Gonzalez, he buys fire trucks. That's his task. He interacts with Public Works all the time to buy those fire trucks for you and manage 614 and manage the shop to fix the fire trucks. But strategically, he certainly needs to know where the budget's happening because how much money does he have next year to buy fire trucks, right? So where is the organization going? What, what is the vision we have? How is he going to impact the strategic plan? So both roles doesn't matter. So think about that a while and process that a while. And I think that when you start looking at it like that, it really starts opening up your eyes as a command officer how you should be thinking. So the expectations from us, from the organization, they're not much different. We expect you to be able to open a Word document. Expect you to be able to maybe open an Excel spreadsheet. Expect you to be able to manage your email. Expect you to have an idea what's going on in the budget. Expect you to know who you need to communicate with and have relationships with, right, to be successful. It, those are the expectations upon you. So think in those terms. As I said, the opportunity and need for leaders in our organization, they are infinite. There are more opportunities than people to take right now. I can tell you that. So that's what I said. If anybody in here wants to promote, the opportunities are going to be there for you. People in this room, I can just about guarantee it, will be a deputy chief in less than two years. So look around. Is it going to be you? Is it going to be somebody else? There will be people in this room who will be deputy chiefs in this organization in two years. I can assure you. The opportunities are there. Just in the next two years, we will have 21 command officers leave. Just in the next two years. I think we're at mm, 10 deputies in the next year will be gone from this organization. We promote off the last list 19 people. So those, you're not going to have much more, those members won't have much more seniority on you if you get promoted off this list soon. So it could be you if you want it. If you want it, put yourself out there, learn the skills, understand the stuff we're talking about, prepare yourself for that next step if that's what you want. It's there for you. So let's talk a little bit about the past versus the present. And this is key that we really think about this. So as I said, a lot of people are leaving. Culturally, we are changing. There's stuff that we're talking about right now that is not something we've talked about before. I guarantee talking about battalion chiefs, thinking about budgets and things like that, a lot of battalion chiefs don't necessarily aren't aware of that think of it that way is we're kind of pushing everybody along, right? We're making we're pushing you harder, making you better. That's the goal, and that's part this part of this process. So what's expected to pass command officers? Well, first level command officer, and that's what I'm kind of referring to mostly today, is really we thought of really thought of battalion chiefs, right? We really didn't think about division chiefs too much. Usually division chiefs in the past worked for deputy, deputy manager, budget manager section, division chief kind of helped them out. Well, we've lost several deputy chiefs, you know, 10 years ago. So those, now we have division chiefs running sections. So in the past, we didn't have even really probably really well-defined expectations for the division chief necessarily. For a battalion chief, what did we culturally, what did we expect? Well, we expect you to be tactically sound. We expect you to support and encourage training. We expect you to go out and run an incident well. Culturally, we really didn't expect you to come by the fire station. In fact, I would say just the opposite, right? We almost didn't like when you come by the fire station. I can tell you, Stan, I can visually see this all the time. Stan at station 18, in the kitchen, looking out the window. 
There's that gate right there. If you've been there, you know what I'm talking about, right? Battalion chief rolls in. Uh-oh, something's wrong. Who's in trouble? What's going on? Why is the battalion chief here, right? That's the old. Culturally, we measured a good battalion chief if you didn't come around the station, right? If you could run a fire and you, you know, were solid and tactically solid and you really supported training and you didn't come by and bug me, you were a great battalion chief, right? That, that was what we wanted culturally. Well, I'm telling you, that is not what we need anymore. I'm not knocking any of those guys. That was a different time. Remember the new building, old building, right? Today, as a command officer, and I don't care what level you are, we expect you to do the things we're talking about, to have that vision, to know where the organization's going, to know how procurement happens, to know what budget, what, what's happening with the budget, to know, have relationships outside the fire, fire department, to maybe attend a council meeting every once in a while, because that's where you're going to learn what's going on in the city and the organization. Maybe attend a public safety and veterans subcommittee meeting every once in a while. And I don't mean every day or every time, every month, but maybe occasionally. It's good to drop in there and see what's going on. And I'm certainly not saying I expect out of you what, I, what is expected of me. I'm at that different level, okay? And so the expectations are bigger on me on those things. I am expected to go every month to the council meetings and subcommittee meetings. You are not. But you learn information. You build relationships at those places. That's where you find out who is going to help you be successful, trust me. And so those are the expectations of the modern command officer, is that you're part of that. We expect division chiefs to manage sections now, to manage their budget. We just went through the 3 plus 9 process, right? May or may not be aware of that. 3 plus 9, we do it in September, third month of the year. We got nine months left. That's where we put in our base budget for the next year. So understand, that's why you have to have that vision one, two, three years out, even as a first level command officer, because what we did today is what we'll buy in, in about 18 months. If we didn't think about it today, we aren't getting it next in a year from this March, a year from this April, we're not getting it. So you have to be very proactive. You have to have some vision. You have to know what's going on, right? So think, that's why you're always thinking ahead. Understand that. But we expect division chiefs to know that. We expect division chiefs to be able to operate in that world. And so these are the kind of expectations that are upon you. And how we measure you, that's how we're going to measure you. Are you reaching that bar? Are you successful in doing those things? You can be. There is nothing I'm telling you that you can't do. Not anybody in this room, you can do it. We will teach you. We will give you the tools. We will support you. We'll make sure you have everything you need to make it happen. So don't, none of this should scare you. This should excite you because of the opportunities and the level of impact you can have on the organization through these things, be able to do this stuff, have those relationships, right? It's a good thing. This is a very, very good job, trust me. I love coming to work every day. I love being a division chief, a battalion chief, a deputy chief, and I love this job, what I do now. Every day I love coming to work. And that's how we measure you. We're going to measure you, oh, by the way, in this upcoming process, right? In that administrative interview you're going to take. These are the kinds of things that we're going to be looking for, I would assume. Questions aren't wrote. I'm not giving any, any secret on that. But I would assume, if this is what I'm telling you, this is where we're at, I would assume that those would be good things to talk about and think about. Process, what does it mean to you? So it is a difference. It is a difference. Culturally, we are making changes. So now we're gonna get right into the heart of the presentation. I mentioned on the objectives, this is the today's modern command officer, must be a leader, manager, or mentor. 100% believe this is the trio, this is where our success lies, right, in these three things. So there is a leadership void across the country. Fire, police, military are in really bad shape as sectors. The private sector is just as much, to be honest with you. But our three are really noted We do the research. I recently com completed a research project on this concept. And that's why I'm, one of the reasons I'm so passionate about it is because I see the need for it. I see how, what the level of impact it will have on our organizations when we start understanding this and thinking about this, right? So there is a huge need but our success depends on all of us understanding this concept, understanding what it means to be a leader. I think that it really depends on you being a good leader. And so it's, what's funny is if you look at, if you've recently been to any class or you take an organizational management class, organizational management books, they typically have management. And then they tuck leadership under management somewhere, right? As one of like eight bullet points of what a good manager is. I completely think that's completely wrong, completely wrong. I think you need to be a good leader. I can teach you to be a good manager. Managing is a skill. If you have it today, great. If you don't, I can get it for you. I can send you a place to learn how to manage things. Leadership, I can put you in a position of leadership. But that's first level on John Maxwell's five levels of leadership. That's positional leadership. You will only be marginally successful if that's where you stay. You have to choose to be a leader. You have to choose what that means to you. Choose to go out and do it every day, right? And that's how you'll be successful. So that takes, you have to make that happen. I can make you a manager. 
can't make you a leader if you don't want to be a leader. But understand, this is where our success will lie. So we've talked a little bit about this. Expectations continue to increase from city leadership, from budgets, from our customers, from just all over the place. Our expectations changing. We're more diverse than ever. And I don't just mean ethnically diverse, I mean just in expectationally diverse, right? What, we're, what we do. Think about it. 40 years ago, we fought fires. Then we started doing EMS. And then we started transporting. And then we got into special ops. And now we're looking at community paramedicine. Everybody's trying to figure out what that looks like, right? LA units, this and that. It's changing, right? These are all expectations. As command officers, it's our job to make sure we're meeting those needs. If we don't keep up with these things, we become irrelevant, right? Someone will fill the void if we don't. Someone is out there waiting to fill the void if we don't. That's why we have to keep our organization moving forward. Our organizations regionally, and when I say it, I'm talking about Peoria just as much as us, we are innovators. We have been for many, many, many years. Chief Brunacini put us on the map doing that stuff, right? Many great leaders before us have done that. So we need to keep that attitude going, keep moving forward. Because if you stop, even if you say, that I'm, I've, I've arrived, I'm not doing any more, I'm not learning anything else. Well, the world changes around us, right? So you're going to fall back anyway. You never stay static. You never stay where you're at. So you need to be moving forward. You need to help this organization move forward. So I talk about the leadership divergence. So as I talked about, the expectations continually increase. Unfortunately, our capacity has steadily decreased. So it's kind of expectations are going up and capacity is going down. We need to change that. We need to bring these back together. We need to keep going up on both. My theory on why that may have happened is, you know, 30, 40 years ago, we hired from a very narrow pool of people. We hired people that were typically out of construction trades, people that were out of the military, people that were out of sports, maybe college athletes that couldn't move on and then became firefighters. All those roles have very one thing for sure in common. There's always a leader follow. You're a player, you're a coach, you're a player, you're a captain. You're a soldier, you're a sergeant. You know, your leadership role. On construction crews, you're a foreman, or you're, or you're on a crew, right? So there was natural kind of structure, leadership. We were comfortable with that. We hired people. You came in, and that was just kind of through organic or, you know, just, it just happened, right? We didn't have to teach this stuff. And that's why we, and we didn't teach it, right? I, I'm, I mean, guys, I know guys been here 15, 20 years, some of them in, in his room, 18 years, 14 years. Have you heard this stuff before much? Have we taught this much? No, because we were so used to it happening. Well, then what happened is all of a sudden we started hiring a very diverse set um, from diverse throughout our community, right? We hired, we're, and we're proud of it. We needed to because we were changing expectations, were changing upon us. We hired, you know, school teachers, and we hired lawyers, and we hired piano players. We've hired a lot of people that were 18, 19, 20, maybe never really had a, a career. They just had, uh, you know, entry-level job, and so they hadn't seen that. So they came in. It didn't happen organically, and we didn't grab a hold. We didn't do anything with it. And now we find ourselves now where we've got this divergence happening, right? We haven't taught about it, so taught it and thought about it. And so that's what we're doing. We realize that. We realize we fell behind organizationally. We're fixing that, right? All of us, all of you will help us fix that, right? Because when you leave this room, I'm going to trust you're all going to go out and do it, right? So we're going to fix this, and we can fix it. So I mentioned already we're more diverse than other at any other time in many, many ways. You guys know that, you know, you can't be, haven't been on the job five years, you haven't seen that. Things change, you know, every, every day almost. You must be constantly learning and growing. This is a huge priority of the fire chief, right? So it's important to her. I can assure you it's important to me. Should be important to you. She wants you to be continually learning. We talked about you can't stay still even if you want to. You need to take advantage of opportunities to go to city classes. Use your tuition reimbursement. Educate yourself. Go to the National Fire Academy back east. It's a great opportunity to go back and meet other people. To, it's free, basically. You buy a $125 food cart. They reimburse you for your air flight. They put you up to stay back there. And there's all kinds of class available. You meet people from all over the country. And that's how a lot of people do their training. So you, know, you really go back there and you really get some perspective on how other people do things. And that's OK. We need to be outward facing, right? We need to look at what are other people doing. When you do that, when you challenge, when you critically think things that we do, you only have one of two options. You either vet what we're doing is right, or you realize there's a better way of doing it, and you bring it back and we start doing it better, right? Because if it's wrong, if it's bad, you're not going to use that. So those are only two options. So that's why, why should we ever not be looking outward, looking for better ways of doing things and challenging ourselves, pushing ourselves. There's other good people out there. We are great regionally. When I say it, I mean Peoria, Phoenix, Glenwood. We are very great organizations. But there are other people out there that have good ideas as well that we might be able to learn from. We should never be afraid to learn. We should be pushing ourselves to learn, pushing ourselves to see what is going on out there. So 
So take advantage of those opportunities, right? You should be, um, you know, you can regularly, you can look at a TED Talk, you can get on YouTube, and you know, we talked a lot about leadership. Do some research on leadership. What does it mean to you, right? You can, all those things are how you continually grow and learn and push yourself. So lastly, as a leader, this to me is what you have to be. You have to be a proactive leader. So I live, my goal is to live 85% in the proactive phase, 10% in the active, and 5% reactive, right? If you live in the proactive, you will, you will pretty much eliminate your problems, your issues. Because if your people know what you expect, and they know what you're going to hold them accountable to, and they know where you want them to go and how they want, you want them to do things, they're going to do it. We hire really good people. They want to do a really good job. Oftentimes we fail to ask them to do that job. Right? So if you are proactive and you're doing that, you're not going to have a problem. And an example I love to give to people, right? When I was out there, I'm kind of a deal, my deal is uniforms, I want us to look sharp, I always make sure we wore uniforms. You know, I'd have that two or three minute speech, sitting there, sitting in the fire in front of the truck, guys are checking the truck off, I'm checking my clipboards or whatever I'm doing, look around, tell them, hey buddy, here's my deal, here's my thing guys. Follow code three rules today, we're going to operate safe, wear a uniform, we're going to take care of customers, right? Maybe two other things that are important to me. Never had a problem. I don't know what they did the day before or what they did the day I le after I left, but you know what? They had no problem doing it. They would do those things, even uniforms, right? Even when I said, I want you to wear a uniform, they would do it. Inevitably, if you don't have that two-minute conversation, if you're not proactive, it, by 10 o'clock, your engineers ran four red lights, nobody's wearing a uniform, and you're like, ugh, now I got to address it. Now I got to say something. Now I got to deal with it, right? Because it's still important to me, and I got to deal with it. Where if you've just been proactive, they'd have done it. So be proactive, right? Look for... Think in those terms. That's part of that vision. Knowing where we're going to go, right? Knowing where the organization is going to go. Know how you're going to help us get there is the way you have to think as a modern command officer, modern leader. One of the, a great example is Wayne Gretzky. So Wayne Gretzky says he was a great hockey player because he skated where the puck was going to be, not where the puck was at, right? Same kind of a thing. And we do it, and most of the stuff I'm talking about, if you think about it, we do this on the fire ground, right? What do we do on the fire ground? What do we teach captains on the fire ground? We teach you when you pull up. Don't assume where the fire's at when you pull up, right? Assume it's gonna be in two, three, four minutes, because it's burned hotter and faster than ever. It's gonna get bigger. Time you get off, get your SCBA, deploy your hand lines, right? So we're proactive on the fire ground. We just need to do that same type of thinking in being a leader and what we do here. So think about where you want your crew to be. What level do you want your crew to be? What level do you want your battalion to be? If you're a division team, you know, where do you want? What do you want to be successful as far as, you know, whatever the work is, EMS, facilities, training, whatever. You know, Chris Healy's at training. Where does Chris Healy, where does the organization need us to be in two or three years? What are those needs he needs to be planning for? Because it takes time. We're a big organization. It takes time to get there. Think about those things. Think about planning and vision. Being proactive. Being reactive, never good. It's not good on the fire ground, right? It's not good anywhere else. So what do we mean, and I guess since I'm in the lecture, what do I mean by leadership? So I really like this definition, a leader is one who is capable of articulating a powerful, positive, and compelling vision for organizational and individual growth, and who can generate the trust and support needed to execute this vision. I think that really defines it really well. If we could all live up to that, I think we'd be a pretty amazing organization, pretty amazing leaders out there. Also talked about leadership, broke it down two ways, two planes, right? The organizational leadership, understanding where you're at, where you're operating, what's happening in that environment. And then there's individual leadership, and that's what we're talking about here. You as a leader, you guys are captains, right? You have crews you manage. You're a battalion chief. You're going to manage a battalion. You're going to manage a division, right? You're going to lead those members. And I don't care if it's a civilian and sworn. It doesn't matter. They're people, right? They, the civilians are a huge support for this organization. They know what's going on. They know how to get things done. Well, operations is the tip of the spear, and we obviously go out and deliver service. It's all these people back here that help us be successful. So understanding how you're going to lead your people and be a little secret, civilians, sworn, it doesn't matter. Be nice to them, support them, show you care, develop them, right? Those, you'll be successful. They will help you successful. Your people's success is your success. If they fail, you will fail, right? I can assure you. So as a leader, you understand you're, you know, developing growth, you're generating trust, support needed to execute on your vision, trust and support, trust-based relationships, communicating with your people, right, and it doesn't matter where you work, 
don't get worried if you hear they're gonna make we're gonna make moves, someone's going to division chief. People all, oh man, they don't want, you know, they they kinda hide, right? No one wants to be seen. Trust me, it doesn't matter. It's the same job, it's a good job. You get to sleep at home every night if you're on a 40 hour 40 hour job, but ultimately you're doing what you said you want to do, you're helping this organization, you're providing to the customer out there. It's just a different way. Build those relationships with your people. I love this one. Jack Welch, CEO of G, says when you were made a leader, you weren't given a crown, you were given the responsibility to bring out the best in others. And I think this is really important that we think about this, right? And so sometimes this can be a little, little harsh, a little stark when people first hear it, but if you're promoting to be everybody's best friend, you're making a mistake, okay? Just like if you have kids, you can't be your kid's best friend all the time, right? Because they'd probably want to eat ice cream every night, and you probably at some point got to say no. Now, if you're promoting to make your people better, to make this organization better, to take care of your people, develop your people, encourage your people, support your people, and help, make, be, help them be successful, that's why you should be promoting. That's the right goal, right? And just understand, as I talked about already, is sometimes you gotta make that hard decision. Sometimes you gotta represent something from management, upper management, and oh, by the way, when I say management, in this level, it's us, right? It's not them, it's us. We are all management when you're in this level. So understand that. And so, just goal, bring out the best in others. Everything you do, the stuff we're talking about. Eisenhower's quote is called, talking about getting others to do something you want done because they want to do it. That's how he defined leadership. So this is a motivational style leadership. This is, you can accomplish this, right, is through the explaining the why, not the what concept. Not sure if you're familiar with that. So what is just telling people, go do this, right? Well, that's the, that uh, autocratic leadership. 40 years ago, you got hired, you had the position, you told people to do it, and they did it, because that was the world we live in. That is not the world we live in now. That will not work, right? You gotta explain the why. And so the why is, I need you to do this because of this, this, and this, right? It's because of budget, budget reasons, because if we do this, the customers appreciate us and they support us, because it's, the right, uh, it's our mission, because it's good for the customer, whatever. Give them some insight, give them some knowledge, right? We talked about if the budget's bad, you're gonna ask your people to maybe not call in sick or maybe take care of the stuff a little bit more, right? Explain why, because if we can save a little money here, we get to support this, right? We get to do this. Give them that. So when you explain the why, you make an emotional connection with people. And when you make that emotional connection, they will follow you, right? As opposed to just telling them. And so my, now, my example on this one is, is, uh, the com is computers. So Dell Computer, they make computers. They make good computers. The city buys their computers. That's what they do. And they make a computer and say, hey, buy my computer. Apple, what do we think of Apple? Apple is a really good company that really cares about people, cares about the planet, you know, doing a lot of philanthropic work, right? Oh, and by the way, they make computers. Do you want to buy one? That's how they sell it. They make that emotional connection with you on how great of a company they are, and then we go buy their computers. And oh, by the way, we buy their laptop for like four times what a Dell laptop is, even though it's probably about the same laptop, right, for the most part. Oh, by the way, we go stand in line every year for a new iPhone, for a thousand dollar iPhone that you could buy a droid for half, probably. But why? Because they got that emotional, that emotional connection with you. That's the why concept, explain the why, not just the what. Make that connection with those that you lead. And then, from when you do that and you build those trust-based relationships, after a while, you don't even have to even give them the why. Because they know if you are telling them, asking them to do something, you've already, you're doing it for the right reason. You have their interest at heart. You're taking care of them. They will just go do it then. So think about that. So this one is really important. To, well, I guess everything is important on this, leader, on this presentation, right? But this one that is important to me, and I think it should be important to you, is understanding is understand your leadership style. So I've talked a lot about leadership, right? What does it mean? You ask people, hey, what's leadership to you? And people, it's one of those things, it's easy to see. I know it when I see it. Sometimes it's harder to describe. If you haven't actually made an effort to define what leadership means to you, it can be very difficult. Leadership is one of the most searched words on Google, by the way. So it's important to you, for me and important to you as to become a leader is to search it out be able to define what leadership means to you, because the way I define it may not be quite the same as you, that's okay. Search out what your leadership style is. We talked about motivational leadership. There's servant leadership, right? Servant leadership, very popular. Many of you, if not all of you, probably heard that term. 1979, Robert Greenleaf created servant leadership. I believe to this day, Brunacini got, somehow got an advanced copy of it, because it's really kind of what the Phoenix Fire Department does, our PFD way, we talk about that. It's really what we do. It's a great leadership style. Southwest Airlines is the mo one of the most notable companies that uses it. You walk down their gangway, it says their, their employee is number one. Servant leadership is all about taking care of your people, putting your people number one, and then they're gonna go out and do the same. They're gonna go out and treat the customer that way, right? That's servant leadership. If that's your style, that's fine. I describe myself as tr a transformational leader. 
It's much like servant leadership and the same thing. I want to support, develop, encourage my people, but I give them a goal. I'm like, hey, we're going there. I'm going to help us get there. I'm going to give you everything you need to get there, but I have a goal. And so I'll read, uh, I like to read the definition and the qualities of transformational leader just to give you an example of what I'm talking about. So a transformational leader inspires people to achieve unexpected or remarkable results. It gives workers autonomy over specific jobs as well as the authority to make decisions once they have been trained. The qualities are model of integrity and fairness, sets clear goals, has high expectations, encourages other, others, provides support and recognition, stirs the emotions of people, gets people to look beyond their self-interest, and inspires people to reach for the improbable. So that's what I try to do every day when I come to work. That's, I have that. I think about that. How can I do that, right? And you don't have to do that. That's mine. You don't have to do that. I'm not saying mine's better than yours. There's also charismatic, there's motivational, there's lots of leadership styles. All I do is encourage you to figure out what yours is, because until you know what yours is, until you know what the qualities that make it up, that why you believe it's what yours is, can you, you can't do it, right? You've got to have some idea what that looks like for you. What does it look like for Marcus Steele being a leader? How are you going to do that every day in the roles you're in now and in the future roles as command officers? Think about that. Come to grips with that. It really, it really helps set you on that path to becoming a leader. Hang on, we're, we're getting through this pretty good here. The next video, the next slide's a video, and so it's, it's basically on leader's intent. Probably have heard of leader's intent. If you've been in the military, I'm sure you have. Military is very big on leader's intent in the sense that you make sure that the mission is very clearly articulated so they can go affect that mission, right? That's leader's intent at that level. I'm talking about, in this video, we'll talk about leader's intent at the, at the, like, on steroids. It's where your people know not only what the immediate mission is, but what the expectations are, how you expect them to behave, ex how you, what you expect out of them, you know, what are the questions you're going to ask if they come to you with an issue or problem, that you expect them to identify issues and develop solutions, vet it out, and then bring them to you, right? It's that kind of a, um, a concept I'm talking about. So the video does a much better job explaining it than I can. We'll watch this. It's about 10 minutes, uh, but I think it's a pretty good video for you to see to really kind of make this point. I was trained for one submarine, my guys were trained to do what they were told. That's a deadly combination. We all know organizations where, where people just follow the leader into disastrous situations. So I got my guys together and I said, hey, we've got a problem here. I was trained for another submarine, you're trained to do whatever nonsense comes out of my mouth. That's right, Captain. I mean, they knew, they already knew. I was pretty much talking to myself. So I said, what are we going to do? What are we going to do, guys? And we talked about it. Okay, what I really wanted to do was get ready for the inspection. But we were sitting in the wardroom. We spent a couple hours. We were talking about it. And we came up with all these different things. And, well, you Captain, you just got to be smarter. You got to give better orders. It's like, well, how am I going to learn a whole nuclear summary? Miles and miles and pipes. I spent a year learning Olympia. Two weeks over here. How's, I mean, so, okay, so in a year we'll be safe? That's not going to work. We had to deploy the submarine in six months. Um, so we talked about it and they said, okay, there's only one logical solution. We figured it out. You, they're pointing at me, you shut up. What do you mean? That's not what captains do. That's not what captains of nuclear submarines do. They walk around, they give orders, they sound like Russell Crowe. Head two thirds, dive, make it up 500 feet. Helm left 15 degrees wider, steady course, two, five, five. Load torpedoes and tubes, one, two, three, and four. Flood down, open outer doors, right? And I thought about it. And you know what? They were right. So at that point, I vowed never to give another order. And if you came down on my submarine, it'd have been very confusing because you couldn't have pointed. It would have been hard to say, well, who's, who's the captain here? Because you wouldn't have seen me giving orders. I did retain one order. The final order to launch a weapon, a torpedo or a missile, I, I kept with me because I felt that, that was, since that was going to result in the deaths of other human beings, that I didn't want that on anyone's conscience but, but mine. That was my moral and ethical responsibility. 
But even though everything else, in the Navy there's long lists of things that says the captain has to authorize. Captain should authorize. You got a couple nukes in your group, they'll tell you it's true. Captain authorize, submerge the ship, get underway, start up the reactor, shut down the reactor, connect to shore power, divorce from shore power. On and on, break rig for dive, on and on and on, pages of these things. I just refused to give those orders. What we replaced it with was intent. Instead of giving instructions, if you want your people to think, don't give instructions, give intent. So they would come to you, hey, uh, what do you want me to do? Well, uh, left full rudder, steady course 255. No! I so said, well, what, you, what, what are we trying to accomplish here today? Well, we're trying to get in position so that when the enemy submarine comes through, okay, so where do you think we should position the ship? Uh, I don't, maybe over here. Good idea, go there. You give intent to them and they give intent to you. So my officer stopped requesting permission. And every other submarine, Captain, request permission to submerge the ship. Submerge the ship. Submerge the ship, I. On Santa Fe's, Captain, I intend to submerge the ship. Very well. And they did it. And it might seem like it's a very small, nuanced change of language, but it was hugely powerful because the psychological ownership now shifts to them. They need to discover the answer. Otherwise, you're always the answer man. You can never go home and eat dinner. And so we started doing this. And it was hugely powerful. Actually, we went another step. Then I got smarter and I said, when the, when the officer said, Captain, I intend to submerge the ship, I, I would ask him, well, is it, what do you think I'm thinking right now? And he'd look at me, uh, hard to tell. I'm guessing you're wondering whether it's safe. Bingo! I said, well, convince me it's safe. He said, Captain, I intend to submerge the ship. All men are below. Hatches are shut. Ship's rigged for dive. I checked the bottom depth. Ship is, the submarine's in the water that's been assigned to us. Then, I was, then later I would ask them, is it the right thing to do? And they would say, well, yes, sir, because our mission requires that we... And these are the two pillars that I think support this idea of giving control. These are the two pillars that need to be in place. The, the technical competence, which is represented by, is it safe? and the organizational clarity, which is represented by, is it the right thing to do? And you put those things in place, and then you can give control, and you give control, and you put those things in place. And you are off to the races. So think about what's happening now. My officers are starting to think like me, because I have to think, like, where, what, where, where should we do the ship? And so the guys below them. Now this took, this took, 24 hours to happen. It took a couple years for the full implementation, but immediately there was change. The officers started thinking like me, and so pretty soon I could go in the engine room, find the engine room lower level watch who was taking logs in the lube oil pumps, and he would know what the submarine was doing. He would know whether we were up tight, close to the enemy, and it was time to stay quiet or whether we had backed out a little bit, this may be a good time to change filters and make a little bit of noise. A year later, we received another inspection. A year later, we received an inspection. The inspecting team gave us the highest grade they had ever seen. Not that year, not in the Pacific, ever seen. Why? I mean, this crew had a captain who was a dummy. It's because that needle moved, started moving up. And on another submarine, there was one guy in charge, one guy giving orders, one guy thinking, and 134 people doing what they're told. I don't care how smart you are. On my submarine, I got 135 thinking, active, passionate, creative, proactive, taking initiative people. It's a tidal wave. You don't stand a chance. Here's the solution. Move the authority to where the information is. You mean the software engineer can decide whether we ship the software? Yeah. You mean the client, my, my salesman, can, just, can close the deal? Well, up to $1,000. No. Yes. Whatever the price? Yes. What does it take to make that happen? Now, if you're picturing a lot of people out there doing crazy things and a bunch of arrows going in a bunch of different directions, you have the wrong picture. You, cre you create 
the environment so that those people are out there making decisions as if the CEO were standing right behind them. And if it's not the same decision, it's actually a better decision because they have the information. And not only will you get better speed of execution because now you don't have this delay, what happens is those people feel like they matter because they're thinking. You engender thinking. You create the environment for thinking. The secret is nothing, is, nothing I said is hard. There's nothing hard. The only thing that's hard is you. It will feel wrong. You've been genetically and culturally programmed to take charge and make it happen. Take Take control and attract followers. And what you want is to give control and create leaders. It will feel wrong and you will repeatedly, repeatedly start down this path if you so choose and then you'll be angry at yourself like I was. And you will have a failure and you'll go back to the old ways. And you will pick yourself up and you will go again. And you will go again. And by doing so, you will achieve the greatest thing possible. You will have achieved greatness, not because of the deeds and acts that you did, but because you set an environment where the people around you and their families and their schools and their organizations and their businesses, they've achieved greatness. That will be the greatest thing of all. Go forth and be great. So if you think about this, we already do this often on the fire ground, right? Roger's a battalion chief. His crews know what his intent is. He can't always be there around back of that house. He has given them intent. And we can take this same idea and move it into as leaders in everything that we do. When we reach this level, organization, with all of you as captains and, and as a command officers and me and the fire chief and all of us reach this, we will be amazing, we'll be unstoppable when we do this. Because you won't have to be there. You people are gonna do what you want done. When Roger's off for a week, his battalion is gonna be running highly effective and efficient because he's created that kind of intent. When you guys are off, your fire truck, you go on vacation, your crew, whether you're there or not, are going to operate that way. That rover's gonna rove in there and thank you every day because he's like, this crew is squared away, I don't have to do anything, they do it all. Right, because you create that kind of intent. They know what you expect of them. Think about that. This should be our goal. It should be our target right here. So what is our goal as a leader? Number two is reach a level of service where your people know what and how to respond and perform and what needs to be done before being directed. That's the leader's intent right there. That's it. First one, to develop highly competent members that consistently exceed the organizations and our expectations. Right? The two to go together, they're tied in there. You're creating those expectations. People know what they are. Yours are what the fire chiefs are, what the organizations are. You're representing that down. They know where you want them to perform. How can they reach that goal? How can they reach that bar if you haven't set it for them? If you haven't told them, hey, man, this is where I want you to be. This is what I need you to be. And you give them this intent. And they know what, what you want done, whether you're there or not. Right? They know what needs to be done. They think along that way. They're thinking like you. That should be a goal. Create the environment where members want to excel. This is, we are, we're a great organization, right? We all fought hard to get this job. Our members have said, are good members want to do a good job? Are we asking them to do that job? Are we preparing them to do that job? Are we getting the tools to do that job? Are we creating an environment where they can excel? That's upon us. As a captain on a fire truck, you are empowered to do that today. As a battalion chief, as a division chief, even for me in my role, I'm empowered to do that. I can create that environment. You can create that environment today for your people if you're not. Be proactive, we talked about that. Have that vision, know where the organization's going, know where you wanna go, and know how to get there. Know where that puck's gonna be so you can make sure you're there at the right time. Right? Think about that. Build relationships. And when I, I should add in here, trust-based relationships, right? So as we talked about, the first level of leadership is position. We put you in that position and, and you're a leader. And you have some authority, but you're, as you know, we're a type A people, right? You all know just your position alone isn't gonna cut it for many of our members. You have to build, go to that next level, which is relationships with permission. People give you permission to be their leader. And that permission is based on trust-based relationships. Stephen Covey, one of the books on the bibliography. Hopefully you crack that one open. There's two parts that Stephen Covey talks about to build that trust. Competency and character. 
So if you're, have, if you're a person of character, you have integrity, you haven't lied to your people, you've come through when you told me to do something, and then you have the competency to do that, you are tactically sound. You can make this happen. You know, you have the skills to make this happen. Those two things, when you do that, your people will start building trust. They will trust you. They will build, you will build a trust bank, and you'll keep building on it and building on it. And then tie that in with explaining the why. You'll get to the point where all you got to do is let people know what you want. They'll do it for you because they already know why you want it done. They know you have their best interest at heart. They know you're asking them to do the right thing. It's within the mission, within the authority of our organization. They trust you to know that you have their back. They trust you to know that you are going to give them credit for when they go do good things, that you're not going to take credit for their work. Side note, if you take credit for your people's work, you are done. They will never get provide for you again, I can assure you. Right? If anybody's in this room has had that happen, hopefully not here, but ever happen, you know how that is. Right? Again, your success is your people's success. Why would I not want to share this with you? Why would I not everyone in this room be successful? Because if I can make all of you successful, and the people here yesterday, the day before, this organization can be successful. I'm going to be successful. The fire chief's going to be successful, right? That's what we want. That's how we should be thinking and operating. Take care of your people. Build those relationships with people. Relationships and communication are the two most important things you can do to be successful, I can assure you. And then create a highly engaged workforce that is constantly looking to improve. We talked about how important it is to continually improve, push yourself, push your people. Create that engaged workforce. The next slide is a video, only about five minutes. Not even that, probably five minutes maybe. And it talks about engagement. And, it, and actually it's more of the private sector. And they talk about 70% of people in the private sector are unengaged workers, unengaged members. Now I don't think we're that high. But if we're 10%, if we're 15%, that is too, met, too high, too many because we all fought too hard to get here, right? Somebody worked really hard to get this job. Why are they unengaged? So watch that video. He does a pretty good job of kind of giving you a little highlight on that. Engagement is all about feelings. As Carl Buchner said, people will forget what you say, they'll forget what you do, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Engagement is a measure of the team's emotional commitment to their leader, and it's critically important for the bottom line. In America, disengagement costs business over $350 billion a year, and in Australia, $45 billion. Gallup studies show only 30% of people are actively engaged despite all the attention on engagement. Do you really know how engaged your people are? In the engagement surveys I conduct, the average business has about 50% engaged and disengaged in total. This is a leader's first great opportunity. The remaining 50% sitting on the fence waiting for a leader to engage them. I call this the leader's sweet spot. An actively engaged team member is around 30% more productive than a fence sitter and retention is dramatically improved. So it's essential that leaders work this sweet spot. A leader's second opportunity is to disengage people or bad apples. Target them as well. Help them adjust their attitudes or help them find another job. Great leaders have emotional intelligence, but to really drive results and be exceptional, leaders need what I call EQ2, engagement intelligence. EQ2 involves really understanding your people, finding their individual motivators, and working on these hot buttons to improve morale, attitude, and results. In my book, The People Pill, and in my engagement presentations, we cover many strategies a leader can implement immediately. They cost virtually nothing and are guaranteed to make people feel great about themselves, which is the real secret to getting the best out of people and engaging them. Some of these strategies include five-minute desk chats. These are a way to show people you care about them. Mary, what's on for the weekend? Sending out personalized handwritten cards that recognize specific contributions are timely and from the heart. Morning teas to celebrate progress and success stories. Holding a breakfast of champions to acknowledge effort. Pretend people have a banner on their forehead. Make me feel special. Remember, people usually leave leaders, not organizations, and it's the line leader's responsibility for attitude and engagement. I recommend you measure your team engagement and implement strategies like the ones above. Focus on that sweet spot to bring everyone along and create a culture of engagement. 
it really will change your bottom line and retain and attract the best people. If you think of the best boss you ever had, it'll be someone who helped you believe in yourself, cared about you and developed and inspired you. In other words, they engaged you. Become a master of EQ2 and be the best boss your team ever had. So while not everything maybe will apply to the fire service in there, but there's a, some good ideas, a different way of thinking things, some good ideas we could apply, we could adapt to what we do, right? It's really about engaging those members that we have. And so one thing if you, pay, if you saw or noticed in there, he talks about if you can engage them, find a new job, help them find a new job. Well, that's not going to happen for us, right? That's not really an option for us. So if we don't engage them, that means we have 10, 15, 20% of unengaged members that are sitting on the sidelines. They're not helping you be successful. They're not helping the organization move forward. So you have to engage these members. We got to figure out why. As hard as we work to get this job, there's got to be a reason somebody's not engaged, right? You got to find out why. You got to get them re-engaged. Our organization are too good, too much opportunity. It's too exciting of a job not to have them engaged. So figure if you need to figure that out if you have any of those people. So on, on engagement and on the goals, the question really is, are we reaching those goals? Are we creating the engaged workforce? The workforce that's ready to come to work in Excel, that understands what your intent is, Ask yourself that. Organization, are we? Are you each day, each, wherever, you're, wherever you are now, whoever works for you, are you doing that now if you're in a supervisory position? So we're going to move into the third, the second leg of the trio. I said three parts, right? Leadership, management, mentorship. So we're going to move into this section. We're about halfway through. We'll be out here in three hours. A few laughs today. First day, no laughs. A few laughs yesterday. You guys got it. All right, perfect. Um, we won't be here in three hours. I won't be here in three hours. You may be here in three hours. I won't be, though. So. This is a key and important part that we understand what it means to be a manager, understand your responsibility. Because it's something that unfortunately, culturally, we have, tend, have tended to um, minimize and almost ridicule, right? We've almost allowed any kind of management to become deemed micromanaging, okay? And so understand as a command officer and as a captain, there is some expectation that you're gonna manage your business, right? Management shouldn't be viewed, it's not, it's not sexy, it's not glamorous, it's not exciting. I can assure you fighting a fire, running a fire, way more fun. But management is part of your job, and we expect you to just to do that part. So just, it's just sterile. Take it and understand, it's just what I do, it's, there's, there's reasons why you do it, it's important, and we'll talk about some of those reasons and why it's important. But it's just part of the job. So when I talk about management is defined as the organization and the coordination of activities in order to achieve a defined objective. It's pretty sterile, right? It's pretty finite. As I mentioned earlier, if you don't have the skills, we can certainly help you get the skills. The city has classes on this. There's lots of opportunities to learn those skills. We have civilians with the organization that are gonna help you be successful if you're in that world. We have civilians up, up top, we have up second floor, we have Melissa and Cheryl that help us with our procurements. They're a huge resource. They want you to be successful. We have lots of civilians who can teach you things and how to manage things and manage your section if you're put into those positions. So it shouldn't be viewed negative. It shouldn't be viewed as something you can't do because it is. It's just part of your job. And especially as a command officer, there is an expectation that you will manage some stuff. So back to my point, I'll give you the difference in my opinion what managing and micromanaging is different, right? So as a battalion chief, if I go out there and I expect you as a captain and your crew to do rig day on Saturday, and I expect you to do station day on Thursday if that's your station day, that's managing, right? Leader's intent, my expectations are clear, I expect you to do that. If I come out there and tell you I expect you to do rig day on Saturday between 7 and 7.30, or I expect you to do station day between 8 and 8.30, that's micromanaging, okay? Expecting you to do your job, expecting you to take care of those things is just managing. It's not bad or good, it's not negative or positive, it's just the job. And just think about it in those terms. As I talked about, there's lots of tools and resources available to you. If you're not sure what they are, or you need help, ask, we'll get them for you. I mentioned the city classes, online classes, Lots of, lots of tools out there. Resources I look at are really people. Homeland Defense over there, Mike Burns, management assistant. He takes care of the budget. He knows how things get done. He's a huge resource for that section. Those resources are there for you. Our civilians are a huge support of what we do every day. They're there to help you and be successful. So program management, we talk about managing program management. Training, getting your members to training. And, and remember, as a battalion chief, obviously you gotta get your members out of training. Chris wants those members to show up so he can get, get them trained. As a division chief, you, got, you have members that have training as well. Our, in the air room, those techs have to have training and certification in order to certify the SCBAs. 
right? We have people have CDLs. So you got to make sure you're managing their training and make sure they're getting that. Because if they don't, there's an impact organization. If nobody can certify an SCBA, you're in trouble. Your firefighters aren't going to be able to do their job, right? So understand there is value to that and just managing that stuff. Hydrant testing, trip reduction, customer complaints, community service fund drive, all things that we just do. They're not things that someone creates to make your life miserable or to make you have more work. Again, it's just one of those things you have to manage. Have that expectation. Hey guys, I expect us to do it. I expect 100% compliance, right? As your battalion chief, you should tell your captains, make sure your people get it done, right? And as captains, you should make sure those people get it done. It's not difficult, it's not hard, but you have to have, it has to be a priority to you, it has to be important to you. And just to give an example why it's important, trip reduction survey, we just finished that up in the organization, right? So just understand how that works. So the trip reduction is a Maricopa County requirement, and they expect a certain threshold to be met. And when the city, if the city doesn't meet that threshold, and it looks down in the fire department, I'm going to use us as an example, could be PD, it could be anybody. If we don't, don't help the city meet that threshold, it reflects poorly on the city. Then it reflects poorly on the county, and then the county doesn't get federal money. So that impacts regionally, impacts us that way. But more importantly, if time after time, the fire chief has to go over to City Hall and apologize because we were at 50% when we needed to be 70 on many, many, on several things, she's using up her leverage, her credit, and her trust in order to apologize for us, right? So then when something big comes along, Station 55, we want to get a temporary station up there. Well, she's got to go over there and say, look, we need to do this. We need money for this. But if she's burned up her credit, it hurts her ability to help you and help our members, right? So that's why that stuff actually is important. There is value. And as command officers, as now being in management, you need to understand and see that. And that's why you have to go out and represent that stuff. And not say, yeah, it's stupid. You know, I'm supposed to tell you to do that. No, it's not stupid. No, there is a reason to do it. Again, it's not positive or negative. It just is part of the job. So understand that and think about that. People management, there's not anything more important to the fire chief, not anything more important to this organization than our people, right? Their health, their wellness, taking care of them, their development, their training, helping everybody move up in the organization. I can assure you, nothing more important to her than our people, than all of you. She talks about it almost daily in some way or another. She's involved in the cancer prevention stuff across the country. She is a leader in that. She's out there every day taking care of you. If she does it, it's important to her, obviously important to me, should be important to you. I would hope it is important to you. I believe it is important to you. Take care of your people. And in all those ways, that's your developing them, training them, supporting them, giving them the tools they need, encouraging them, giving them expectations, giving them leaders intent, following up on them if they have a problem or an issue. You know, civilians, same thing for those civilians. Hey, how are you doing today? Remember, they went on a vacation. Hey, how was your vacation? Or they have a sick kid. Hey, how was your kid? Right? Oftentimes, our civilians get a little bit neglected. Right? We move chiefs in and around sections quickly. Right? Sometimes we just, because we're comfortable in our world, we're all comfortable. We all are firefighters. We all worked on the fire station yesterday, and now you're in this role, maybe not as comfortable. They are hugely important. Many of those civilians have been in sections 10, 15, 25 years. You may have been there, moved in there, and you may be there a year. Right? They know where their bodies are buried. They know how things are done. Let them help you, but show them some love. Support them. Let them help you be successful. It's really important. Again, they're just people. They like the same things we like, right? They like a little credit, they like a little recognition, they like a little bit of communication. So take care of your people. Budgets and contract, contracts under management, we talked about this, right? You need to be aware of it, you need to manage it. Division chiefs are certainly gonna manage a contract, but as a battalion chief, I will tell you, if you think you don't manage or impact contracts, or I mean budgets, you're wrong. So let me explain why. As a battalion chief, you impact more budgets than anybody else. Mark Gonzalez, and I'm picking on Mark this whole lecture, I know. Mark Gonzalez manages the fleet services budget. He manages that one budget for the most part, right? His staff, buying fire trucks and those things. You as a battalion chief impact everybody's budget because if you don't make sure it's a priority for your members to go to training and they miss it, Chris Healy has to pay somebody, or probably two or three people, 2.1 again because you've got to send them down there because they've got to get the training. If your people aren't taking care of that fire station when it's a little plumbing leak and it gets big and it becomes a mold remediation, Facilities has to pay for that. So that may be two other stations we don't get to fix or improve because we just lost that sixty, eighty, hundred thousand dollars. If your members somehow wreck trucks a little too much, you're impacting fleet's budget. If you haven't encouraged your members to come to work, instead of calling us sick, maybe, you're impacting constant staffing budget. Because we gotta staff those fire trucks, right? So you gotta cut you're impacting that. So understand as a battalion chief, because you manage the largest number of people out there, you have more impact on the budget than anybody. So don't think you don't impact it. You should know what you should be aware of that. Think about that. 
Time management. As you move up in the organization, you're going to find that time is a commodity. It's a very precious commodity. Just managing emails can get very cumbersome sometimes, right? You get hundreds and hundreds of e emails sometimes. And they, I mean, they'll fall off your screen before you get to see them sometimes. So you've got to learn how to manage your time. Use your calendar function. You know, prioritize things. Use your email function. There's even classes on how to, how to manage your email at the city if you need it. So understand how to manage your time, how to be successful. You know, there's going to be expectations you're at meetings, there's expectations you're doing this, expectations you're following up on people. So learn how to manage your time. It's a very important skill you want to, you want to develop as a manager. So the third leg of this trio, and while I won't say the most important, I will say equally as important as anything, for sure, is your role as a mentor. So mentorship is creating supportive relationships with others in order to share knowledge, experience, and wisdom with those that are ready and willing to learn and benefit from that relationship. So as I mentioned, I completed a research project. This was part of it. And so this was an area we did very well, which surprised, did not surprise me, right? What do we do? We hire firefighters, we send them to the academy. They get out of the academy, we send them to fire trucks for three months, three different stations. We're mentoring them, right? We're developing firefighters through mentorship. That's something we've done culturally very well historically. We need to make sure we're applying that to, again, our leadership development, our people development in those, skill, in those areas as well. And identifying members early and start developing them. We talked about that. Those new members out there, they're hungry. They're calling. They want to be mentored, right? We've got to be looking for them. Don't ignore them. Help them get there. You know, all of you, as I said, if you're not being mentored, you need to get somebody to help mentor you. We all have responsibility to you and you to the next generation to mentor people. Look for the opportunities to do that. Utilize the fit positions as mentorship programs. Again, I'm talking to you as command officers, right? We have 27 battalion chiefs in the system. High probability when you're promoted, you'll be a battalion chief compared to, I think, eight division chiefs. So the odds are in your favor, okay? Use your fit positions. This is an issue, for, this is a pet peeve of mine. The fit position is a natural born mentorship position, right? That's what it's there for. That's what we should be using it for. We should not have people in fit positions that aren't on the current chiefs list or taking the test, okay? I appreciate we have friends, I appreciate people are getting close to retirement, but we are in too much a need for future command officers to be wasting those spots currently, okay? We need to use that. As you become command officers, you become battalion chiefs, you're gonna find those, you're gonna recognize those people out there that wanna take that next test. You're gonna get a hold of them, and you're gonna mentor them right in that position. What better opportunity but to create the next battalion chief out of that fit spot, right? So make sure you use those positions. That's the way to use it, I believe. So monthly staff meetings include development. This is another key piece that we do not do very often in the organization, both as battalion chiefs and division chiefs, right? Battalion chiefs, set up a time, monthly, bi-monthly, whatever. Have your captains come in Sunday morning, whenever it's slow for you. Take an hour out, get them to come down there. Get them together so they can hear your expectations. You can create that leader's intent in that same room. They're all hearing the same thing at the same time. They're talking. You might have a captain, two captains that have the same issue in their, in their first dues, and they don't even know about it. If, they, if you hear that as a battalion chief, you're like, I need to help them. I need to fix that, right? That's your chance to have that communication, that two-way communication, where you're talking to them, they're talking to you, you know what's going on. You're going to be tied into your battalion. That's how you're going to be successful and help your people be successful. Also in that time, carve out 15 minutes as a little bit of a leadership or a development time. Show a TED talk. Show a quick video like that. Hey, guys, I saw this video. What do you think? I want to show it to you, right? That's how we're mentoring, we're developing people right there, but you're also helping to run your battalion. Division chiefs, no different. Or if you're in staff, the staff meeting is a hugely important tool. Get your people in the room, get those civilians, the sworn. Find out what's going on in that division. What needs do they have, right? Where are they going? Do they know where you're going? Do they know where the organization's going? It's highly valuable when people hear the same thing from you, when everybody hears the same. We all know how that is, right? I can tell you something, and then I'm going to tell Steve something, and I'm going to tell Jeff something. It's going to sound different. And by the time it gets back to Mike, it's going to be totally different. We know that. Let them get together. Use that staff meeting opportunity. And they like it. I've done it in all of the places I've went, and there is, there is people like it. When you do it, they appreciate it. They want to hear what you have to say. So use that as a tool for development. We talked about always looking for personal growth and development. That's yours. That's your people, right? Take advantage of all the opportunities we've already talked about. I won't beat that up anymore. And remember this one. You're always mentoring. Make sure it's positive mentoring, right? You are mentoring people right now. Wherever you work, people are watching you. Those one-year, two-year, three-year firefighters, those five, ten-year firefighters, they're looking at you. They're watching what you're doing. They're looking at me. They're looking at dep other deputy chiefs, other battalion chiefs, other assistant chiefs, the fire chief, right? You are mentoring them. Just make sure, it's, make, sure, make sure it's positive mentoring. Make sure you're aware of that. We've all been there, right? I'm sure right now in your mind, 
you can probably think of a, some command officer, somebody, some captain, somebody like, not the guy I want to follow, right? But this, then you have this model. This person over here, like, that's the guy I want to follow. That's the person I want to emulate, right? You have them. They're mentoring. They're both mentoring you, right? So think about that. You are mentoring people right now. And if any of this was unclear, if I was gray on any of this, this maybe will help clear it up, right? Right from your fire chief's mouth, Chief Kara Cockburner, you're not mentoring. If you're not mentoring, you're not doing your job, right? That's her position. She knows how important it is for succession planning. She knows how important it is we make the, create the next generation, how we, that we create all of you, prepare you for these roles. You know, one day, I'll like it for you. One of you guys up here having this conversation with somebody, right? That's how we do it, through mentoring, through positive mentoring, through making that effort, looking for people, not waiting for them to come to you, help people get there where we need them to be. So we talked about before we leave the room, I want to have a strategy how we're going to reach our goal. So really, this is it. It starts with having the courage to challenge yourself to be a leader. You will leave this room and decide if you want to be a leader. You will leave this, leave this room and decide if you want to look up what leadership means. Decide what your leadership style is, right? You guys will make that decision. You will choose to push yourself. And I know there's some new things we're talking about. You know, we're, we have to step out. We have to move forward. We are moving forward. I want you on that train. I want you part of the future, right? So have, be, have courage, step out, push yourself, challenge yourself. Start your quest today becoming a leader, manager, mentor. All the things we talked about, you can do. As a captain, everything we talked about applies to you. Maybe scale down a little bit, right? Maybe scale down a little bit, but it applies to you. You can start today. You can start your preparation and doing these things today. You must, or we must, develop a vision of what type of leader we want to be. Again, that's why it's important to research it, about what leadership is, about what styles are out there. You have to have a vision. How can you, if you don't have that goal, if you don't have that picture where you want to get to, how can you develop that strategy to get there? How do you know when you've arrived if you haven't thought about that, right? Have a vision of what kind of leader you're going to be, what kind of a manager, what kind of mentor, what kind of command officer you want to be. Create that vision. Strive to be highly effective. We make that choice, right? We can come to work every day, work really hard, make this organization better, make your people better, make yourself better. Or we cannot. You will have to choose to do that. Build trust. We talked about Stephen Covey, The Speed of Trust. I really like that book if you haven't picked up on that. Character and competence, that's what it's about, right? People will follow you based on these things. And even if you make, even if you fall short, you know, you build that trust bank up, maybe you make a mistake. You take a little withdrawal out of it. Build it back up. Keep building those trust-based relationships with your people. Inspire action by explaining the why, not the what. We've already explained that, so I won't go that again. Create that emotional connection with people, right? Let them know why it's important. They will do that. They will follow you once you do that. Continue a process of learning and growing. We've talked about that. Make sure your priorities are consistent with becoming a leader. So for me, it's pretty clear. My priorities are this. The customer, both internal and external, is number one thing to me. The organization is number two, and I'm number three. Every day, that's how I think about it. That's, every day, I think about what we can do to help prepare you and the people that work for you out there to do the best job you can. Right? That's what I think about every day. And then I think about how I make this organization. For me, I talked about you guys' role is going to be a one, two, three year vision, right? In my role, my vision is 10, 15 years out. I'm thinking about, right now, the next four fire stations, where they need to be. How am I going to help us get there? How am I going to make sure I have fire trucks for our firefighters to be in those stations? How are we going to meet that service delivery need that is rapidly growing, right? That's what I'm thinking about. And you guys will think the same way, maybe not quite so far, and I don't expect you to think that far, but in that three, four-year window, one, two, three, four years as battalion chiefs, division chiefs, where are we going? Where's the organization going? How are you going to make the organization better? How are you going to help the organization, ultimately helping our members? Keep those priorities consistent. Keep them straight. Last two slides. So I'm sure several of you have signed up for the command officer's test. I'm sure several of you over here, this is what we all want, right? We all want that golden nugget. We're all looking for something to help you do better than the guy next to you, right? That's how we are. I appreciate that. I've been where you're at. I understand that. The secret is, there is no secret. Why would I keep, why would we keep a secret from you on how to be do good, how to make the organization better, how to excel, right? No, we don't want to do that. I'm giving you the information that you need to know and need to have and need to internalize and process and figure out for you how, what it means to you, what it means to Keith to, to move forward, right? So here, this is the bullet point version of this presentation. This is the things that I would suggest you come to grips with and learn with and think about, right? Starts right here. If you want to do well on the chief officer's test, command officer's test, prepare to be a command officer. Don't prepare for the test, right? Prepare to be a command officer. Have a vision of the role you seek. The biggest mistake I see, I've done a lot of interviews in the last five years on both sides. 
But I'm sitting on the other side, when people come in, people tend to test up. People, captain interviews, we hear very, very good firefighter answers. Battalion chief command and division chief or command officer interview process, we hear really, really good captain interviews, right? Test up, because people are preparing for the test. They preparing for what they think we're gonna ask them. They prepare for what we think you want, we wanna hear. We want you to do well. We will help you do well. Th this is to help you do well, right? We need you, trust me. We need you to do well. This organization needs you. Prepare for the pro to be a command officer. Prepare that vision. You should leave this to room today and stop, almost nonstop thinking if you're taking that next process about what that means to you, what that looks like, how you're gonna do it, how you're gonna be a command officer in the way we talk. How are you gonna be a battalion chief? How are you gonna be a division chief? What does a vision, a three-year vision mean to you? How, create that vision. Start looking at these things, thinking about these things. What can we ask you in an interview process if you have creative vision, what could we ask you you can't answer? There's nothing, right? Because you're already thinking along those ways. You've already taken the stuff we've talked about. You know what we need, what the organization needs. You already know how you're gonna help this organization. You know how, already know how you're gonna manage a battalion. You already know how you're gonna be a division chief, right? You already see yourself doing it. Have that little vision in the corner of your eye when you're answering those questions. See yourself doing it, right? Think in those terms. The test will take care of itself if you prepare yourself to be a command officer. T prepare for that next level of the role you seek. Understand the strategic and task levels of the role. We talked about that, right? As a first level command officer, you got strategic level and you got task level, right? Understand the difference, understand how, where you're operating, understand who's in that plane with you, understand who you need to be communicating with, who you have built relationships with, how you're gonna be successful, how you're gonna move this organization forward, right? How you're gonna help other people come up, who's gonna replace you? When Keith, you replace me, who's gonna replace you, right? Think in those terms, think about that stuff. Learn to communicate. Can't talk about enough, early, often excessive, right? You can't communicate too much. You're communicating up, your boss should be communicating with you. You should be communicating down, and your people communicating with you. You're communicating horizontally. You can't communicate too much. You should understand is, so for me, I wanna have as many contacts on my phone I can have. So when the fire chief calls me at three o'clock in the afternoon and says, hey, I need this, you know what? I have people I can call. And I guarantee at three or four o'clock around City Hall, maybe there are not a lot of people there, but I got their cell phone. I have relationships, I have communicate with people. I can call them and get the answers for the fire chief. That's how you've got to think. Communicate early, often excessive with people. As I said, the relationships and the communication are the two most important things you can do to be successful. And that's the next thing, build relationships. Your success will be equal to the level of relationships you have. The number of relationships you have is how much success you have in this organization and probably in life. Think about those things, build those relationships. Be a courageous leader, we talked about that. It takes courage to do that. You have to step out, I appreciate that. Be a courageous leader. Manage your business. It's not positive, it's not negative, it's not sexy, right? It just is what it is. We expect you to manage your business out there. Mentor others. The organization's success depends upon that, right? We've talked about that. Continual learning. Fire Chief's priority is that we're always, always learning. Always, constant state of learning for her. Continual learning. And by the way, I would think about, I talked about using your tuition reimbursement and going to college, or going to school. I would expect in the near future, in the higher levels of the organization to promote, you will have to have a degree. I'm not saying captain, I'm not saying command officer. I'm not saying don't leave this room saying I told you somebody or I said you have to have a degree to promote. But I'm telling you, I would expect it, certainly at the higher levels and working its way down. There is value to getting an education, you, especially now with the programs are out there with GCU and NAU, you're learning directly stuff that will directly help you do this job. You're learning those skills, Excel spreadsheets, PowerPoints, Word documents, interacting with people, building relationships. You will learn those skills in there. I would encourage you to use the money the city's giving you to make yourself more valuable, make yourself better, help you get what we're talking about if you don't have a degree. So just realize the future is, as we talked about things changing and expectations, that is an expectation upon us. Just to give you an idea, so we tend to minimize our role as a battalion chief or division chief or deputy chief, right? We're all firefighters. Understanding the city, the year to equal, is a very high position. In the city, to get this level, oftentimes you have to have two master's degrees to get the job you guys are gonna apply for and try to get. So understand that, so understand that's why there's expectation that you will see educational requirements probably becoming you know, upon us. I'm not saying tomorrow, I'm not saying the next 30 days, I'm not saying the next six months, but I would anticipate that. I would start getting ahead of that if I were you. Critically think, this is important. This is not challenge authority, but this is just critically think, right? The one thing I ask me people never, never say to me, don't say we're gonna do it this way because we've always done it that way. That is not acceptable, right? If it's still the right way today after you critically thought it, 
you've vetted it through labor, you've looked at different ways of doing it, it's within our mission, it's within our authority, and it's still, and technically there's no other reason or no better way of doing it, it's still the right way, perfect, tell me that. We've always done it this way, and I've evaluated it, boom, 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 still the good way, okay, great. But critically think, look for ways to do things better. Everything changes in life, right? We know that. So how come we, how should we not be looking possibly to change the way we do things? So critically think. Always take care of our people. We talked about that. Keep them safe. Number one priority, I would say, for the fire chief. Keep your people safe out there. Support the strategic plan, the RBO action plan. So this is what I wanted to kind of give a little quick little explanation of this because this has got a little convoluted. So we come together. We create a strategic plan. The strategic plan is a three-year plan based on the things we came together and agreed upon were the big things that the third department needs to fix, needs to work on. We create within that three-year plan milestones and deliverables to accomplish that plan in three years. Sometimes it'll go longer. Sometimes we'll extend it. Some things do. That's okay. We'll just extend it the next time we create it, right? So that's the strategic plan. RBO action plans. RBO action plans are one-year plans that we come together. Same thing, labor management. Identify these one shorter-term, shorter-term issues that can be resolved typically within a year. They may support the strategic plan, or they may be their own items that gets resolved. So that's the RBO process, right? In, in all of that, we use work groups and subcommittees. You will be a co-chair as a command officer on these subcommittees, right? We have a labor and a management co-chair on these committees. So that's the RBO strategic plan process, very abbreviated. Support and be involved in the labor management process. The labor management process, when you start looking outside Phoenix and the region, you realize nobody else has it. It's very one of the most unique things we have. It's also one of our strengths that we have. It has made us successful, and it's well worth the work we put into it. Be part of it, support it, the fire chief supports it, and it, will make us, it makes us better and stronger. Be aware of that, be part of that. Be innovative and forward thinking. You know, economy went bad, we became a little inward facing, budget, we had no money. We started to use that, I think, as a little bit of a crux not to look outside, not to push ourselves. We had to kind of, kind of almost like, you know, stabilize ourselves, right? Well, no longer are we, can we do that. Now we need to be back innovative, forward thinking. The regional area, the Phoenix Fire Department, the Peoria Fire Department, the Glendale Fire Department, we are trendsetters, right? We need to be back looking for ways to move this organization forward, move the fire service forward. Somebody's gonna move the fire service forward. It's either gonna be us, or it'll be that volunteer in Nebraska. Nothing against the volunteer in Nebraska, but I think I want us to be leading the fire service, right? We should be leading, engage, be aware of what's happening out there, look for ways to make us better every day. And then finally, keep your priorities right. We've talked about that, my priorities are what they are, the customer, internal and external, the organization, and then me, right? You gotta have some, some litmus test, some guide for you, right? You have to have that, you have to know what that is. So keep your priorities right, help move the organization forward. So finally, are you up to the challenge? Right? If it doesn't challenge you, it doesn't change you. I know some of this stuff has probably challenged, has challenged the way you think about things. I hope it has challenged some of the way you think about things. This is, cha- this is a new direction. We are changing the culture to some degree. I love being a firefighter. I love the traditions of the fire department. And I'm not saying we ever forget those, but we also know we have to continue to grow, right? So we don't forget our traditions. We also have to be able to move forward and help the organization move forward. So. It's up to you. You guys will leave this room. I hope you leave a little better. I hope you take away something that we've talked about. I hope there was value here for you. And I hope you think about this stuff and figure out how you can apply it to what you do every day, right? That's really my goal. That's my hope to make you guys better. So finally, any questions? This is your time. All right, well, that's all I got. So if you're good, I'm good. I appreciate you guys coming. Um, I hope, like I said, I hope it's a value to you. Take it, think about it. If you want to challenge me on it, certainly you can reach out and we'll talk about it. I'm always available. If you're not being mentored, ask somebody to mentor you. If you're not, if you can't find my mentor, you call me. I will get you a mentor. I will mentor you myself. So, all right. Thank you, guys.